and we're going to record it. Um, so a warm welcome to all of you. I know this time is uh, difficult for the Greek part and it's midnight there, but um, I will start with uh, inviting Peter to uh, introduce Ellen Cardona. Thank you. A warm welcome from me as well to our participants and to our guest, Hélène Gardona. Hélène is a supremely multilingual and multinational creator and artist in so many fields. Born in Paris of a Greek mother and a Spanish father, she was raised all over Europe and is a citizen of the United States, France and Spain and she spends time in each of those countries, as well as in Greece. She studied English philology and literature at Cambridge, England, where she obtained um, a translation diploma from the Royal Society of Arts. She studied Spanish philology and literature at the International Universities of Santander and Baeza, Spain, and German at the Goethe Institute in Bremen, Germany, and Paris. She attended Hamilton College in New York. She also taught French and Spanish and the Sorbonne in Paris, where she wrote her thesis on Henry James for her MA in American Literature. She worked as a translator and interpreter for the Canadian Embassy in Paris. It was in Paris, uh, in yes. correct? Yes. yes. And has taught uh, in various places in France and the US, in addition to working as a French language expert for arbitration but her skills and her talents don't stop there. She's a graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York, and she's known for her acting roles in the films Chocolat, The Hundred Foot Journey, Star Trek Discovery, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, World War Z, Serendipity, and more. Last but not least, she's also an award-winning poet and literary translator, and she's a dream analyst. She has over 20 awards and honors to her credit, including a Hemingway grant and the Independent Press and International Book Awards. The seven books she's published include three bilingual poetry collections. Describing her own work, Hélène says, I write as a form of self-expression, fulfillment, transcendence, and healing to transmute pain and experience into beauty. American poet and literary critic John Ashbery wrote the following about her poetry collection, Life in Suspension, La Vie Suspendue. Dappled with transparent imagery, like the Mediterranean sunlight she grew up with, Hélène Cardona's poems offer a vivid self-portrait as a scholar, seer and muse. And in her review of the same collection, Vasiliki describes it as one of the most imaginative poetic manifestations of unconditional love and grace. There, the reader dons a piece of white sail wrapped like second skin and sets off in an ecstatic hovering over an infinite space made of stars and waves. This is a seamless universe, as it is exactly a child's poetic imagination that allows for the reenactment, the reenactment of an oceanic feeling of bliss. The act of the rocking of a cradle activated here transforms a painful experience of loss into a constant transfusion of life, fueled by love and light. And David Mason, poet laureate of Colorado, describes her work as liminal, mystical, and otherworldly. This is a poet who writes in a rare light. Hélène, bienvenue, bienvenida, Carlosorisate, welcome. Merci, merci beaucoup. If Haristo Parapoli, I am incredibly thankful 
to be here with you and um, thank you so much for this very warm welcome. As you know, Imitera Munelinida. And so I really grew up, um, I was born in Paris uh, because my mother had left Greece. Uh, she had studied law in Greece and then she had um, left Greece to, to, for postgraduate studies uh, in France at the University of Nancy. And that's where she met my dad, who, um, so my father's from Spain, uh, he was born on the uh, island of Ibiza. Uh, and um, he had had to leave uh, Spain um, because of Franco's dictatorship, uh, because of his writings. And um, he had translated, uh, for instance, Stendhal, uh, Le Rouge et le Noir, The Red and the Black. And I mean, the, the, he was going to be arrested and he got tipped off. And so he, he, um, he left Spain and, uh, and he was also doing postgraduate studies uh, at uh, the University of Nancy. Uh, and so uh, I was born in Paris and uh, we moved very shortly afterwards. Um, I was one month old, actually. Uh, we moved to uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And um, so I grew up. Uh, surrounded by the mountains. Um, we first lived in the city and then outside of Geneva at the foot of the mountains. And uh, I loved it, you know, as a child. And I, I uh, went to the uh, music conservatory in, in Geneva in Switzerland and studied um, ballet and the piano and graduated with a second prize. So I was very um, uh, infused by, by music and, and dance and nature. And, and animals, I, I had a dog, um, I had to, and, and so my poetry really uh, uh, is very rooted in, in, in all of this. And uh, I picked up German um, already when, when uh, as a child in Switzerland, my parents had German friends and I wanted to learn it. And, you know, in Switzerland, everything is written in three languages, French, German, and Italian. So, um, um, so yes, the, uh, the, in terms of, you know, what inspires me a lot, I, I, um, I draw a lot from, uh, from music and from, from nature. It's like they're very, um, they're meditations, you know, and when I was playing the piano, I, I didn't have the words for it at the time, but I entered, you know, uh, uh a place that was, you know, outside of, of, of space and time in a way. And um, we moved back to Paris and, um, I, and, you know, and I would go, uh, since I was a child, study in England. I, I was an Anglophile early on. Um, and after we moved back to Paris, um, I was 14 at the time. The French system is um, selection through mathematics. Uh, science is what's most important, uh, considered most important there. And so I was very good at math, actually. I excelled at math as a child. It was just a, a game for me. And naturally, I went into um, the scientific section um, and got a scientific baccalaureate. Um, you, I could still, you know, I had Latin since, um, since I was very young and um, I kept studying Spanish and English, and um, but the focus was on on mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And of course, when you graduate from there, it's like you're not going to, you know, the pressure is to continue in those fields. And my grandfather, my Greek grandfather, was a doctor, and my dad also was very keen on me being a doctor. And so at 17, I found myself in medical school. Um, and after two years of that. <laughs> I had a terrible uh, depression. It was just not for me. I just, the system didn't suit me at all. And um, I, um, I had a breakdown. And it actually was a very, very deeply spiritual experience for me because I, I got in touch with something uh, else, something that I, I, you know, was not, that was not part of my consciousness in, in a way, like I wasn't conscious of it. And um, I, I could say that was pretty much an atheist until then, not that I'm religious now, but I have this connection, very strong spiritual connection to something bigger than me. And, and that experience where I actually was very close to death, um, 
is really something that has stayed with me ever since, you know. And um, so I decided that I would I would really do what what nourishes me and and because I was pressure still to get um, you know uh, um, an education in terms of uh, academics. Uh, I wanted to be an actor then, um, um, but I studied literature because I loved it. And I would, you know, I would do some theater on the side with the English department of the Sorbonne until I got my master's. And um, the, um, uh, you know, as Peter mentioned, the, the, the theme of my master's was the search for fulfillment in Henry James's novel, you know, The Wings of the Dove. It was just for me, um, I came to the realization that I had to fulfill myself. And I had started my PhD and just really, it was like now or never, you know, and I left for New York. Um, and ever since, so I left for New York to pursue acting and I, I uh, attended the, Academy, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is one of the oldest drama school in the US. And, um, um, and have, uh, and, and focused there for a while. Um, but I had been writing poetry since I was 10. And so I was still writing poetry, but I wasn't really doing much with it. And now really I have, I have been able, I have learned, I have, I have, uh, I have uh, merged all my different selves, you know? So I, I, I'm a poet, I'm a writer, I'm a translator, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a dreamer, uh, I do dream work. And so the, it's just wonderful to finally have all my different selves like come together, you know, and and <laughs> and to form a whole, basically. So, and in a way, it happened. Um, e even though the the beginnings were brutal, uh, it ended evolving in an organic way. Because uh, when I was in New York, I I studied with a a wonderful coach, uh, Sandra Sikat, and she's the one who introduced me to dream work um, to help. Uh, build or define a, a character that I'm working on by um, asking uh, for a dream um, about the character. And so I continued that dream work where basically you, you work uh, with, with, with your subconscious to find answers. So it's very therapeutic. And at the same time, um, I can use the dreams. You know, a lot of my poetry comes from my dreams. Um, so, um, um, and, and my love of animals and um, medicine came in a different way into my life, came back in a different way into my life because I was very interested in shamanic studies. And so um, that's very interesting for, for Catherine Streisig because I, when I was in New York at the Actors Studio, one of my coaches um, did a workshop in Santa Fe. And that's the first time I went there to do this workshop and I loved it. And I, I felt this really deep connection with the Native American culture, its relationship to um, nature and animals. And so ever since I've been going to, um, to New Mexico and to Santa Fe, and, and I've spent a lot of time there. And so shamanism and for me, you know, we're, we're all connected, we're all one, right? So uh, humans and animals and nature uh, and, so I've kept that connection and, and uh, the healing aspect of, of uh, not just through the dream work, but through the writing, through the poetry, which is really to transmute, you know, pain and experience into beauty to, to just create something, you create art out of it. And, and that's really what the shaman does, right? You heal yourself and then you can heal others. And so it, that, that's, you know, that's the journey in a way. And translation comes into it as well, because I was always, you know, growing up automatically translating from one langu la language to another, because at home there was uh, Spanish and Greek and French. <laughs> and, uh, and we were going to Spain and, and Greece, you know, for holidays. And, and then I was going to Germany and, and England and Wales. And so translation is really a part of everyone's life because just uh, when we think or see anything or express ourselves, we translate everything that we into thoughts, right? So there's a, an immediate process of translation. 
but by translating also other um, poets and authors, this is a way to, to bridge cultures. And that's what I think is wonderful about it. Like you, we wouldn't have access to, to, uh, to other um, uh, poets and writers if it wasn't you know, from different cultures, if it wasn't for translation. And so it's a way also to know yourself and to know where you're from and your roots. And it's also a way to, to have empathy and understand other culture and, and, and people who are different from, from yourself, because then you, you don't see the, the others as others, right? You, you, you just, there should be no fear of the others. You should, you should see how similar we are, even in our differences. So for me, the, it, it, it all comes together um, that way as well. Um, so I've translated um, French poets. Uh, I've translated my father, who's also a poet. Uh, in 2008, the government of Ibiza published an anthology of his work called uh, El Bosque de Birnam, Burnham Wood, which I translated into English and, and, um, and which is, you know, um, a collection of poems from different collections that he had published earlier on about his love, you know, for his native land, um, you know, being part of the diaspora, and and also it has a political element. Therefore, the title Burnham Wood, <laughs> in terms of the reference to Macbeth, uh, because of what you know, Spanish people had to endure during Franco's dictatorship. So all of that really has has affected me in terms of. Um, uh, I don't write uh, anything overtly political. But it's it's I think it's always there, you know, underneath. I mean, Greece had a terrible uh, dictatorship with the colonels, and ma many of my mother's friends were tortured. Um, Vasilis Vasilikos, who wrote uh, Z, who was a friend a friend of my mother's, and um, so we 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 have this history in in Europe where we had to um, uh, live or or our, you know our family members did through through dictatorships so i, I think it, it's a more acute awareness of what goes on like even in the us right when when things happen and democracy is in danger <laughs> so um but i yes so for me you know i i i think everything comes together and and the acting is 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 um a beautiful way to express myself both in front of the camera and and as a voice actor as well, because I, I love recording voices for um, for movies and, and, and shows like uh, animal voices and all kinds as well. So in a nutshell, <laughs> that's my background. Um, if you want, I can read the poem, um, Life is, uh, the title uh, poem of Life in Suspension, which, um, is um, my history until I, I first came to the US. Um, life in suspension. Let me introduce myself. I'm the memory collector, your companion and spirit guide. Let's unwind the clock. Peel the past. The reflections you give me, conjure, surrender from within. I throw into the fire, the cauldron of resolutions. They burn into embers and flickers that evolve into butterflies. They flutter away, heal and free you of all chains so they can revisit and reinvent who you are. Let the dance begin. I'm in my mother's womb in Paris. She's scared. I want to get out. I'm three years old in Terracina, Italy, sharing a room with four girls. My grandfather visits from Greece. He holds my brother on his lap and says, a boy at last. I'm not impressed with girls. I'm four years old in Monte Carlo. My mother takes me to school. A pigeon poops on my scarf. She reassures, it brings good luck. I'm five years old in Carban, Germany. It's St. Nicholas Day, my birthday. Marie-Louise feeds me Lebkuchen, Stollen, and Pfeffernissen. 
they taste like heaven. I'm six years old in ballet class in Geneva, breaking my point shoes. The Russian master ingrains in me the correlation between pleasure and pain. I now know the two centers sit next to each other in the brain. I'm seven years old in the Swiss Alps, making snowmen, skiing, hunting for Easter eggs. My mother laughs, then says, your father can't be left alone. I'm eight years old in the Jura mountain, in love with my dog, playing chess with my dad. I'm ecstatic. I'm nine years old. My grandmother takes me to the market in Tarragona to buy the bitter and pungent quince she craves. I'm 10 years old. My cousin drowns me in the beautiful blue waters of the Spanish Mediterranean because I threw sand at him. My head hits the hard bottom, all the air's gone from my lungs. My last thought is, no one knows I'm here. I'm 11 years old. My mother makes jam with apricots, strawberries, peaches, and plums. She's filled the house with the intoxicating scent of gardenias. My brother throws another temper tantrum. I'm 12 years old in math class, mad with laughter. I'm 13 years old. The music conservatory in Geneva is sheer magic, an enchanted world I inhabit alone, the key to my soul. My piano teacher has so much faith in me. I'm 14 years old in between worlds. My aunt married a fascist. He grabs me by the throat. It's the middle of the night. It's loud, I can't sleep. I'm 15 years old in Northern Wales, riding a fabulous horse along stunning steep cliffs, racing him to full gallop in bewitching Celtic wind, relinquishing cravings in the dust. I'm 16 years old, off to San Diego. My mother cries at the Paris airport. She breaks my heart, but the pull is stronger. I'm learning to let go, trust the ripeness of the moment, that everything happens at the right time, to appreciate what I have. I'm connected to my bones, filled with the richness and texture of space, uplifted, vibrating, reverberating, I become the sound of Tibetan bells, echoing and hovering in the cosmos. I perceive the whole world below, life in suspension. And so I also wanted to say that I am named after my maternal Greek grandmother. Um, my name is Helen and her name was Eleni, obviously. <laughs> so um, I carry that within me. Um, I'm going to, so a lot of the poems uh, in, in my collections, both uh, Life in Suspension and, and Dreaming My Animal Selves are, are uh, dedicated to my mother. I wrote a lot after she, uh, she passed away suddenly. And so it was a, a tremendous shock. And it took me a while to, to, um, to make something uh, of the poems and, and, uh, and, and I created these collections. Um, so this is a poem dedicated to her. Um, and there's a, it, it's called To Kitty Who Loved the Sea and Somerset Mom. And it has an epigraph by E.E. E. Cummins. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. To Kitty Who Loved the Sea and Somerset Mom, the angel, who smells of my childhood, my mother, piano and oboe, whose face the icon reflects, auburn hair like a Modigliani, eyes the color of rain, light caught by surprise, whose presence the absence reveals, whose laughter burns snow, whose warm breath I breathed this morning as I woke, the scent of gardenias whispering, I never left you. And this is really how I feel, is that she's always there. Um, gardenias were her favorite flowers. And um, 
And so one day, one night, she came to me in a dream as the um, Celtic goddess, Seridwen. And, and then I wrote a poem about it. My mother, Seridwen, the light on the icon, the way I see her in my dreams, the core of her at the edge of darkness, in a magic cauldron, always full, never exhausted, that brings her back to life guarded by a golden serpent, coiled in the shape of an egg, the world snake marshalling inner reserves, the seed of a new journey, a glimpse of a mysterious and elusive woman crowned with morning glories. This is how she lands on the page, slanted, looking out in space, integrated within me, save the blue sky, across her face. Um, I have another poem also that takes me back to uh, my childhood. And uh, Vasily Key, did, you, you did say something really interesting about you know, the strong connection to, I think childhood for me was in many ways a very uh, enchanted time because of where I lived. Um, and, and the, the, the magical connection to nature and, and, and music and dance. And it was really a, a magical world to, to be in for a while. Um, and this is called From the Heart with Grace. Wind, who yearns to be savored, offers me three cups overflowing with eternity, daemon of insight, the opportune encounter enraptures quintessential distress, ruffles a strange quietude, kindles a jeu d'esprit, glückliche Reise, propels the fervent fragrance of heliotrope, hyacinth, and honeysuckle. The tremulous hibiscus taunts me to warm climates, reminds me I remain a thistle, resilient, rooted, in Mediterranean Celtic fringe. Do you remember a language older than time? When a shiver down my mother's spine was worth a thousand words and the melancholy in my father's eyes reflecting Lake Geneva was indecipherable? There, unbeknownst to me, in a world inhabited by swans, I too swim in concentric circles to find the resonance of my core and discover that in dreaming lies the healing of earth. In dreaming, we travel to a place where all is forgiven. In dreaming is the divine created. And the great oneness whispers ex voto, I am Santor by any other name. I am Griffin by any other name. I am mermaid by any other name. Ma raison d'être, insubstantial, chameleon, excavated like a talisman from wreckage, resplendent fresco, catapulted beyond whimsical, metamorphic frontiers. So my name in Spanish, Cardona, means thistle. And the thistle is also um, a symbol of Scotland. So I found that really interesting. And the, the swan is also an animal that has a, is a recurring theme in, in the sense that in Lake Geneva, you know, is, is full of swans. And then uh, my father was nicknamed uh, El Cisne Vallisolitano, which means the, uh, the swan from Valladolid in the sense that they considered his writing, like, you know, um, the, the, how they say, that in Spain, uh, uh, a certain kind of writing comes from a certain place, just like in France, you know, they, they, they used to say as well that um, uh, the region of Tours, Touraine had also um, uh, great writing came, came from there. Uh, and I think um, anyway, that's like, he was, he was defined by that in a way. Um, 
but I have um, I have had my grandmother also uh, come visit me in a dream and and with Spanish words as well. And sometimes it's a scent, and sometimes it's um, music. Um, so there's a a poem um, that uh, I woke one day with with this music. I just wish I was like able to transcribe it and that just didn't happen. Night messenger, I wake in a meadow braided with wild grasses and flowers. Notes of music drift from a harp. A penguin is running. I follow to the river. He lays on a leaf, lets the current carry him and says, this stream is your life. Instead of watching from the meadow, flow with its rhythm. Guided by Scottish pipes, I reach the gate between my past and the waterway. Like the penguin, I lay on a leaf. Let the river transport me, knowing I've entered another world. Um, I'm going to read a, um, a poem that has a, that is dedicated to a, a Greek goddess. It's called Dreamer. Ah, to get a glimpse of Aphrodite and be touched by grace, see beauty everywhere, forgive all in myself and surrender, surrender, surrender. Ah, to get another chance at love, for I worshipped Athena and followed Artemis. Taste the cypress pomegranate, dive into the ocean, have your heart broken. Consider this, be fortunate, grateful. Consider this, be alive, for the greatest gift is given with death. There is no end and no beginning. Surrender, surrender, surrender. I pay with my mother's death for the price of my dreams. As I dream the world into being, as I dream new memories, as I dream myself into love falling into you. Ah, to let Aphrodite guide you to the great spirit who proclaims again and again, mountains am I, rivers am I, Wind, sand, and rain am I. Moon, sun, and stars am I. Her voice will not be silenced, for it is formidable and echoes those of all beloved. It is her privilege to serve you, for like seeks beauty and complexity. Will you perceive with the eyes of the heart, heed the call of the jaguar and hummingbird, let the wheel of time absorb you. Have your heart broken. And I wrote this poem just about the time I met John, my partner, who's also a poet. And so sometimes there is this synchronicity, right, in life where you know you are meant to meet, you know, uh, some people in your life. I think everybody actually that enters your life plays a role uh, and some are, are meant to stay longer than others. But I think um, everything serves a purpose. So um, here's a, a poem. Um, that's the poem that um, Olympia Dukakis quoted from when I asked her for a, a quote for the book, for a blurb. <laughs> it's called Galactic Architect. From the bottom rung of a ladder in the sky, I hang in a void. Ultramarine, ultramarine is all I need. Let it be simple. Build a cottage for the spirit to rest and soar. I trust 
self-contained, in equipoise, resources at my fingertips, deep-rooted ghosts supporting the foundation of a throne to explore and claim whole worlds, surprised to find you here with me, lighting up my life. How are we doing? <laughs> So um, I, growing up, I uh, was also, I think one of the things that made my childhood, I think magical was that I just read so many fairy tales, right? The French ones from Peru and um, German ones, Grimm and Russian ones with Baba Yaga. <laughs> and I was really like so, infused by that universe. I think I just could spend days on end, you know, read, reading them. And um, and then of course, you know, we, we grew up with poetry in France and in Europe in general. Uh, it's, it's really a part of our life. And um, so, Here is one that has, uh, this one is called Galahad. Um, I took the sword and laid it on the bed and said, I'm walking away. Riding horses in the rain, I bless the past. All dragons become sublime fragments of life, artwork, a chance encounter in the woods, delicate, potent and violent, the dream, a gift of healing. Oh, I am Galahad and don't need to search. He carries the falcon on his arm, aims straight for the heart, hits precisely in the center and leaves me between tears and ecstasy. I scrutinize waves for answers. They raise themselves like ghosts. Dolphins jump out of clouds guide me among whales through incessant oceans of transformation. Galahad's eyes reigning over me. Falcon returns and says, fly with me, let the wind claim you. Um, this poem has an epigraph by um, Hart Crane, who's a poet I love. Stars scribble in our eyes, the frosty sagas, the glowing cantos of an vanquished space, a mind like lightning. Without gravity, I fly into a thousand pieces, add sparkle to various reflections, fallen stars, colliding lights, transform particles, waves, and dark matter. I become ocean, mercury, silver shimmers, fairy tales, fascinated. The strangeness of this atmosphere seduces, shifts consciousness, shapes bloodstreams, provokes a rush. Let the next dimension pull you, lightning mind, prosperous poet, dualist without a fight. Let the lake talk, embrace it. And that, that is a poem that came uh, from a dream um, where I had um, a couple of images, but then I, I engaged with them and uh, in what we call active imagination, where you, you have a dream and then you just, you know, ask questions to, so this is, this is how I look at dreams, right? It's um, partly Jungian and partly um, shamanic. So from the Jungian uh, approach, I look at everything, you know, in my life as an aspect of who I am. And I think that's true for everyone. And so in the dream, every element of the dream is a part of who I am, a part of who you are. And you can, you can um, have a conversation with it. You, have, you can have a dialogue with it. 
And um, nightmares, for instance, are there to help you. It's just not easy because it's, it's not pleasant to revisit nightmares like the, for me uh, and for everyone, I think the, the first reaction is to just get away from it and not you know, want to remember it. But an element, uh, something in, in your life wants to, to draw your attention. And, and, and if, if you don't become conscious of it, it'll come visit you uh, in a dream as a nightmare to, to get your attention. And I'm not talking about like, you know, because there's all kinds of different dreams, like the ones, the bad dreams you may have because of having eaten like heavy food, right? That's like different. But that, so let's say there's um, uh, a figure that is threatening or, or an animal that is, you know, attacking you. You do want to face them um, because it's like facing your fear and by engaging with it, you find out that that actually that figure or that animal really, really is not going to attack you. You know, it just wants something from you, uh, an acknowledgement, for instance, or something like that. And so um, it's also interesting for me to to connect how certain dreams will come at certain times in your life. Um, where they will echo something that happened in the past as well. And because it's being revisited in a different way. Um, so like the one dreaming my animal selves, both collections, but they, they, they really are, are um, uh, very, uh, very inspired by dreams. This is one, uh, again, that was also a dream uh, that I turned into a poem. Uh, and it has an epigraph by another poet I love, H.D., which is, when my soul turned round, perceiving the other side of everything, and it's called Pathway to Gifts. Whispers wake me. I return home behind a procession of swans to an island in the heart of Paris, on the cliffs where the wild ones come to show themselves. I sing this whistling song. Look at the other side of the world as if a deck of cards spread out to pick under and flip over for a glimpse at the hidden side. This, the dream, opens forgotten realms of creation. I think that's what time is. So when I met John, who's my partner and who's a beautiful poet as well, we also had this connection that I had lost my mother young and his father had passed away even younger. And so this is a poem um, dedicated to, to him and to his father. Notes from last night to John, in memory of his father. One can distinguish Van Gogh from Chagall, that state of in-betweenness where even objects seem alive, to do, to do with light and looking pure. Because of all this light, I am partially blind. It doesn't matter whose ghost you see, as long as you see one two darknesses together across the shape of face. Warmth comes forward, cool retreats. I just experience. Talk about faith, I don't believe. Experience is cellular. In our normal state, we're not able to perceive. That's why I think the dead know. I had never before seen the beauty of it. Everything has to do with light every ghost proof of the afterlight, any ghost. And this, you know, was um, a, a poem that, that came together. It was a mixture of looking at paintings. I, um, I had met this um, poet, uh, this painter, uh, Dan Bacardi, um, 
after doing Chocolat, and that's, uh, I met Leslie Caron on the movie and we, we stayed in touch. And she invited me uh, to the um, uh, premiere of, uh, of Le Divorce here in, in Los Angeles. And so we were there and we met um, this painter, Don Vicardi, this artist, and John and I ended sitting for him, Leslie had, and a lot of uh, writers sat for him. And um, actually, John ended using one of his paintings for the cover of his poetry collection, The Mind. Um, and so it was, you know, looking at, at different paintings and, and, and letting the, the, letting the light uh, af af affect me, basically. Um, because what happens if you, if you look at, I think, anything for a while, you start seeing an aura of sorts. But then in order to see, you need to not see. It's like, it's very interesting what happens with sight, right? So this poem came from that and a discussion I had with John, um, you know, about ghosts and uh, how I always wanted to, to see one. Um, and um, I wanted my mother to visit, you know, I, I, I missed her terribly and, and, and that never happened. She's only come to me in dreams. But one day I was um, invited somewhere at a lady's house that I, I did not know. It was the first time I met her. Um, she had a, a house in Malibu um, overlooking the ocean, but, but high up in the mountains. And I was facing, uh, I was looking at her, but I was looking out. So I was facing the light and there was a light, a lot of light coming in. And then all of a sudden I saw her. It's the first time I saw what I would call a ghost because I have no other words for it. But on, on her shoulder was this, um, this face, this head. And, and then I, I described it to her and I, I said, does this resonate? And, and it was her mother and she had never, never seen her. And, and it was this strange way of seeing where all of a sudden it was very real, but, but it's not really there, right? And it's the only time that I had such a, a, a strange experience with seeing something like that. And it did not pertain to me. It was not like an, anyone I knew, um, but this poem came out because when, when you miss someone, you do want to find a connection, right? And so, um, so, um, but the ghost came uh, a different way. And so I put it in this poem that way. Oh, the um, poem, the poem I'm looking for is, is in this book. It's called um, Spellbound. And again, it has some of the, the fairy tale in it and shamanism. Fall asleep at the lake tonight, no boundaries, like a fairy. I am the eagle song, a calling, light defying gravity, someone to steal horses with, a case of mistaken identity, tears transforming into fish in the air, a force that propels forward, proclaims who I am with a passport from God. Her will, an explosion with bullets for words. I offer you everything. Stardust, silence, impish grace, and flutes like birdsong, mischievous, good and bad, pulled out of myself into the spell. I ask the unthinkable, move so fast, breathless, delicate craftsmanship. I walk on all fours, elongated, neither human nor animal, a creature you only see in magic. I'm going to share um, um, a poem of my father's uh, from the collection of his work that I have translated. I have a um, I have translated a few um, a few collection uh, his which is um, Burnham Wood, and um, a beautiful French poet uh, Gabriel Arnoux Jacques Beyond Elsewhere, which is also um, 
uh, very spiritual, uh, long narrative poem. And um, Dorian Lux, whom I translated into French this time uh, with Edition du Cine in Paris. I also translated Walt Whitman um, into French, his uh, war writings, which had never been translated into French. And that was done for uh, the University of Iowa with Christopher Merrill and Ed Folsom. And they wrote also, um, and there were a lot of texts, they wrote prefaces and afterwards of, of the translations and, um, and, and the texts. Um, it was, it was uh, letters that he had written, it was poems that he had written, and during the war he um, uh, worked the Civil War in the United States. He worked as a kind of a nurse, you know, he, he was helping the wounded uh, on both sides, actually, and, uh, and he, um, he was writing letters to the uh, family members of the soldiers uh, on behalf of the soldiers, you know, which was very healing to them. And it was extremely moving to, um, to work on these translations because a war is horrible, um, really. And um, wh when a country hasn't had a war in a long time, it seems a lot of people seem to forget the horrors of it. And, um, and it was really heartbreaking to uh, to read to read these texts and to translate them. But they they were I mean they're very beautiful and they're very powerful. The poem I'm going to read is from Burnham Wood, and um, it's actually a poem um, that uh, my father wrote uh, in memory of his one of his brothers. He, he um, one of my uncles, one of my, my father had two brothers, um, died fairly young. I knew him and uh, when I was a child and I loved spending time with him and his wife, my aunt, Josefina. And, um, and he was a mariner. So it's called Ode to a Young Mariner, to my brother Manuel. The sea is a bride with open arms with stout rubber balls for breasts. It is difficult to refuse her caress, dry from the lips her brackish aftertaste, forget her sweet bitterness. Underneath her waters wails a rosary of dead centaurs, watchmen of the shadows. Handsome men, hard as anchors, torn from the chest of a barbarian god. It is difficult to refuse the call of the sea, cover one's ears, grasp the neck with both hands and become suddenly mute or pluck out one's eyes and feed them to the fish, to ignore the gulls and red masts and so many pennants and the ships arriving from unknown countries and the ships departing from others, barely known or perhaps for hours, because we carry within, like a blue keel or masts and spars, the marine bitterness of kelp, the stripes on the back of fishes, the tarry death and our initials written in the sea. The sea of mariners, your bride, brother moving away to the bridge, like one more piece of our island, you know the smell of death because you tread beneath a cemetery that can be yours and you go brightly. You know how the sea smells of life, how at times she spits a ferocious foam, how she wails wide and rises like an atavistic being, a primitive creature. We all carry death within, written in furrows, like a name traced by the keel of your boat in the sea. We are all sailors of a sleeping bride with round breasts. I don't want to depart for the land, to sprout like a eucalyptus branch, my eyes blinded by grass. Wait for me, brother, when you anchor your vessel in the sea you've loved. No need to depart so alone, mariner. 
brother of a sea man gripped by the earth's open jaws. So my mother uh, was born in Thessaloniki and her mother's family was from there. Uh, her father's family, my maternal grandfather was from Crete. And so an island, Ibiza, an island, and, and the Mediterranean is so important, I think, to you know um, Spain and Greece, France has a portion of it. But I, I have this connection to the, to the sea and to the ocean and, and the need to be uh, near it. You know, in Geneva, it was a lake uh, when we lived there. It was mostly mountains. And, um, and New York, I lived, I lived in New York uh, eight, nine years before uh, moving to Santa Monica. Manhattan is, is an island too, uh, surrounded by water as well. And so I... I, I I feel very strongly connection to 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 that, and um, and uh, I love being around it. I, I find I find it has a, a very healing uh, influence on me, and I love the mountains too, of course. But yeah. How are we doing with time? I think it's so wonderful. Um... How about opening up to questions now? What do you think? I love the gifts of your poetry, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a spellbound uh, uh, in, in one of your poems. Spellbound, you said no boundaries, like a fairy tale. I felt like the whole reading was like that for me, very healing, very uh, enchanting. Uh, and I, I feel like everybody must have felt the same. So I'd like to hear from them if you, if you want. What do you think, Peter? Yes, I, <laughs> you feel ready to, to transition into some questions and answers? Sure. I, I love that. Yes. <laughs> I just want to underscore some of the, the themes that, that really struck me and that resonated very much for me. Uh, nature, reminiscence the mythical, the surreal, light, um, images of shimmering light, stars, and, and so much more. And um, I was, I also struck that I, I see so many similarities in the, the themes that you touch on in, in with uh, Vasily Kiss poetry as well. And I really find a kindred spirit in your work. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We are kindred spirits, yes. <laughs> yes, and surrealism is also, and the dream work is part of that kindred <laughs> spirit. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, the uh, like I said, you know, it was traumatic how I had to leave Europe in a way, but it was uh, really what it was for me. It was a, a process of individuation, right? Because as a child, I was very eager to please my parents. And because I could do all these things, it never occurred to me that there would be a point where I couldn't do them. So I, I was a, you know, I was a pianist. I was a dancer. I, when we moved from Geneva to Paris, I, I, um, I was referred to uh, Maître Sancan, who's who's a master there, and most of his students really uh, were, um, prof you know, professionals. Like they, this was going to be their profession. For me, it was just something I loved. And then I, I had been dancing since early on. As a matter of fact, the reason why I started dancing so early was because I started walking too early and I was just, you know, not walking right because it happened too early. So I was put in dance class to straighten, you know, my legs and, um, and I loved it. I had uh, first a Russian teacher and then the conservatory in Geneva. And then I, I uh, um, uh, was dancing at Salpleyel in Paris and I was part of a dance company. So I found myself um, a math major trying to juggle all that, you know, trying to still be a pianist and still be a dancer and perform. I performed at the Theatre of the Champs Elysees, for instance. And, um, you know, I loved languages and, and, and literature. And I just got stretched too thin, is, you know, what happened in, in medical school. And I really found myself in a world where I had to give up some of, of the art in order to stay there and it became too much. And then that was revisited again because 
you know, in a way, it's like some 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 people know right away what they want to be or do. Like from an early age, they have a, a strong calling, and and I do believe that as artists, we are called. Right? It's not really a choice we have. And so for me, I wasn't able to to listen to that because I was I, I was giving into the pressure. Like I wanted to please, and I was like, oh yeah, I'll be a doctor, but I'll be a dancer and a pianist and I mean who does that right and 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 an actor I mean that's really at 17 I, I was thinking those thoughts and and I, I came crashing right the gift from that was it was a, a deeply spiritual experience and then it was revisited again because uh you know after getting my master's degree I I I had to realize that I, I had I had to leave. I had to leave Europe to 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 be fully myself because you know the the pull to remain in academia was just too strong, and so <laughs> later on, right, I can reconnect with with teaching and such. But but um, what's really um, interesting in terms of how things happen in your life, for instance, um, when I uh, was in New York, after I graduated from, from the American Academy, I went to study at the Actors Studio. And at that time, Ellen Burstyn uh, was teaching two classes and, and that was it. And I was very lucky to get into one of these two classes. And she, she uh, taught it partly at the studio and partly at her uh, house upstate New York. And at the very end of it, because she's very mythical. And so she had put on a table various objects and she asked each of us to close our eyes and grab one, pick one, but without knowing what it was, right? <laughs> and so the one I picked is, was um, a dove, um, a brooch, which I, 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 you know, I didn't think of bringing it because I didn't know I was gonna talk about that <laughs> as, as uh, things happen, right? And so a, a dove taking flight, which is, you know, uh, the title, The Wings of the Dove of the, the novel I wrote my thesis on in terms of, you know, um, I love Henry James. It's just one of he, my favorite novels of Henry James too is The Ambassadors. And one of the characters says, you know, live all you can. And so uh, this is really what it's about. You know, you have to, you have to live your life. To, you have to express yourself the way you, you're meant to. And it doesn't always come easy and maybe it never comes easy to most people, but some people, it seems have a, an easier path to it. Mine felt very convoluted. And at first I had a difficult time understanding it. And I think the dream work uh, played a role in terms of, you know, um, working with your own self and getting answers from yourself. And, and I think the spiritual element of my life, you know, that was something that stayed with me from then on, you know, because I had another crisis after <laughs> my master's. That's what pushed me out of Europe, basically. And one talks about faith, and I, I mention it in, in the poem. And for me, I, it's not really that. It was really experiential, where I connected with, with something else that has stayed with me ever since. And it's true that, you know, uh, the part, the faith part does come into play in the sense that you that you have moments of doubts, right? Like you, you, at, at least me, you know, they, but, but the sense of like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I'm meant to do is, is stronger because it's really what's pulling me. So um, I, I do think we are, what we are here on, on this earth to, to fulfill ourselves, um, uh, a destiny, what, you know, whatever it is for everyone, but it's not an accident that we do what we're doing. I think we are meant to be doing it. So it transpires into the, you know, into the poems and the writing, yeah. Mm. If, if, uh, yes, Nico, yes. First of all, uh, uh, Felena, I would like to thank you very much. I was, uh, uh, I really enjoy uh, your poetry and uh, I want to thank you, all of you, not only uh, the people who organize it, but also people who are here and attending. Uh, uh, many things, uh, uh, you know, have in mind, but I, I will focus uh, to one or two of them. One is, uh, about the dreams, because this is, uh, uh, for me, also very, very important. And I would like, uh, I would like to know, uh, since you have this, uh, on one hand, the French uh, background and tradition, uh, 
because the dreams was uh, uh, the, the, the basic ingredient for the development of uh, surrealism. And also, also as a sociologist, uh, uh, the French sociologist Louis Althusser, he, he did uh, a tremendous analysis of Marx using Freud's interpretation of dreams to, to analyze uh, Marxism. So this is one part. And how all this play uh, a role uh, to you, this, this uh, French uh, education you had. And also for me, uh, one of my favorite American poets is uh, John uh, Berryman and um, the 77 Dream Song. Yes. How, but, but, uh, and I want to know uh, how, uh, what kind of direction you give to the dreams, uh, uh, because oh. th this, is, this is the important thing. Oh, you have the dream, but how, how do you direct them? And if you write, uh, the, the the next day, I mean, the morning after, or it, it has to be it has to be somehow sit uh, to sit in first and and then bring it up. I, I would like to, to to hear about the writing process of yours, and also uh, 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 yours uh, will understand my my question more because uh, uh, because uh, he he he's dealing with that. What is your ethnic identity after all? You know how how the Greek background plays a role. You have a very a magnificent a, a complex uh, uh, background. So uh, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up with Greek mythology, right? I mean, I I was like uh, reading all the Greek mythology, you know, uh, growing up. Um, mm -hmm. I'll mention, you mentioned uh, the surrealism, um, uh, two authors, two books that I absolutely love. One is uh, Nadja by André Breton, uh, which is really beautiful. And the other one is um, Nightwood by Duna Barnes. And T.S. Eliot wrote the introduction to, to that. And in a way, you can look at the wasteland as, as being a bit surrealist as well, um, a metaphor, right? But the, um, the, um, the uh, yeah, like the uh, surrealist, uh, it's, it's the power of, of dreams and the, and the subconscious, right? That, that feeds surrealism and the, an element of strangeness and, and um, oddness, you know, and a strange beauty uh, that permeates all of that. And what it does, uh, it, you connect with it in a in a, a non-rational cerebral way, right? It just gets to you uh, in directly, you know. I think to the core of you, you you just don't know what it is. It's just it's images and it's the subconscious and it's um, uh, it, it it's it reveals without you know uh, having to analyze it and 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 you can trust it, you know. So. The way I work with dreams is um, both both of the suggestions you you made is um, well when they come spontaneously I just write them when I can and and sometimes if if it wakes me in the middle of the night I have to write it then and and if I'm too tired or lazy I I, I can lose them in the morning and that's happened. Uh, otherwise, when I remember them in the morning, I write them down. Um, when I ask for a dream, so when I ask for a dream, for whatever reason, uh, looking for an answer for, for something, right? Uh, I use a, a formula, uh, a letter that I write and this is what you would want to use, a letter and that I learned that way uh, through, through, uh, through the dream work that I did, a letter to my inner self. And I ask for permission um, because I might be asking for something I'm not meant to know, uh, at least at the moment, right? So I write, I start the letter like this. It's, it's short, it's just dear inner, dear inner self, if it is your will, Please give me a dream tonight that tells me or shows me and I ask what it is I want to know, right? And then I sign with love and respect and Helen, right? And then I see uh, if I remember the dream because we always dream. We just don't always remember them. It's just what it is. So if I remember the dream and um, upon waking, I'll write it down. And if I don't remember the dream, then the day is still part of the dream, is the waking dream. 
So it's all one, right? It's, it's the sleeping dream and the waking dream. And during the day, following the night where I've asked the question, there will be something unusual that day. There will be a surprise. There will be something different that will stick out. And that will be the answer. Because the answer uh, to the question of the dream, and even if you don't have a question, but you have a dream and something is unusual about it, different, that is always the solution. Um, and then, and then you work with it. Yeah. In in what language do you dream? And if uh, the language of uh, the writing coincides the, with the language of the dream? Yes. So um, I dream in the language of the country I'm in. So right now, uh, when I'm in the US, I dream in English. When I travel, and so that's that. Sometimes in the dream, there will be um, a word in a different language that can come up. Uh, um, uh, for instance, and, and some, sometimes in the dream, there will be something new that I, a word that I didn't know before the dream. Um, um, I mean, Seridwen, I, I didn't know that Celtic goddess until she came into the dream. I had to look her up. <laughs> um, uh, so when, let's say, I, I go to Europe, to France, um, there will be a, a slight delay. Well, the first night or a couple of nights, uh, I'm going to still dream in English, and then it'll switch to French. And uh, what happened uh, to me, um, my father died in, in 2018, in, in July. Um, what happened with my father um, was the circumstances were difficult uh, uh, for a different reason than with my mom, because my mom, it was sudden and she was still young. So that was a, a shock. But I got to spend um, time with her because when I found out she was ill, I, I was in New York at the time, I dropped everything and, and I spent a lot of time with her. With my dad, um, he had Alzheimer's at the end of his life. And so I had to go back and forth a lot to, uh, to look after him and to find a way to have him be in a place where he could be looked after properly. And, um, and there, were, um, there was a difficult situation around this with my brother's behavior. So I, I had to do a lot and I had to also be in Spain uh, where he has a place and, and um, clean it up and have it ready so I could rent it and, and, and have that along with his pension to put him in a really good place where he could be you know, well looked after. And, and I was like flying back and forth. Like I made eight trips in that, in that year. Uh, between France, Spain, and the US. And so what happened to me at one point, it was just so much uh, that I remember waking one, one morning after coming back to Santa Monica and not knowing what country I was in anymore <laughs> uh, and what place I was in. But usually uh, when things are a bit less hectic than that, um, it just takes a couple of days to, to switch to the other language for the, for the dream. Yeah, <laughs> and, and for me, um, um, I choose to write in English now because I live here and English uh, became my language of choice, you know, when I moved to the, uh, to the US. Uh, but French is my first language, and, but English is my fifth. And so my collections are bilingual, as, as you mentioned earlier. And so what happens is I, I write in English and then I translate them into French and then I revise the original English a lot of the times because um, I, I find that it can be improved because translation is, is, um, is very unforgiving in the sense that if the original text is not very good, it's very hard to translate, right? And so that's the, the gift of great poetry is that it's beautiful, it may be difficult to translate, but it's, it's, you have great material to start with. So, you know, the translation, uh, should be good. If there is a weakness in the original, um, it comes up uh, when translating it. So for me, it's been a dance between the languages. Basically, I was able to, I, I never thought of it. I mean, you know, what happened is my first book, The Astonished Universe, was published by Red Hand Press. And the 
publisher suggested to me, why not have it as a bilingual collection? And so after that, I did it with the others and, and it was worth it because I improved, you know, I, I improved the original. And this brings up another translation question in terms of like, you know, how faithful or free um, should the translator be? And for me, I always want to be faithful to the original. You know, I want to, I want to honor it. And, and, but the idea is that to always capture the essence of the orig original text, even if you have to uh, make a little change. But I really try to be faithful. With my own, I was able to be freer in the sense that if I wanted to change something, because it's my, it's, it's my creation, it's my text, the original is, then I felt in the translation I could um, I could change something if I wanted to, which is not something I would do uh, with uh, any uh, any other author. Uh, and I know some poets do; they take liberties and and they and they are very creative. But even though the translation is is a new creation, is really it becomes a hybrid, right, of the creation between the translator's work and the original text. I still want to be uh, faithful to the original. Uh, so far, I've I've worked that way. Yeah. yeah, I loved your expression of a dance between languages. So that's why we have also the title "Swinging Between Languages." So in a way, diasporic poetry takes on a new meaning with your case, and uh, and in that case, you don't have this longing for one lost home because it, you don't seem to to long for a home because you, it, you seem you you are at home in so many languages um yes well i, I try <laughs> <laughs> so you really amplify the notion of um diasporic poetry and and you give something new in in my own conception of uh, perception of uh, of what diasporic poetry is. And here I would like to uh, invite George to tell us something about it because he also deals with diasporic poetry a lot in a very different way, right? And now, okay, let me see. Uh, <laughs> so I have no choice but to ask a question. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts and for reading your poetry. Um, I have a question about crossing of boundaries, uh, cultural and geopolitical, and uh, negotiating certain borders. Uh, I, I listen to your poetry uh, from the uh, position of a working class immigrant, where mobility has always been an issue, and crossing of borders could be required always immense labor. Uh, there was the issue of um, poverty. Uh, there was the issue that I started learning languages uh, very late in life. Uh, there was the issue of not having a passport uh, for 10 years, which put me into an exilic, exilic position. So it seems that we somehow, um, in terms of experience uh, and speaking about the, the diaspora, diasporic experience, somehow we have different positions vis-a-vis um, -vis how we have experienced and how we have negotiated these crossings. It seems that, I, I mean, the way, the way I listen to your poetry, it seems that your mobility has been immense. It's astounding for me. And uh, certainly the, that you're inhabiting so many languages is extraordinary. So I was wondering, uh, about to what extent and how your poetry helps us understand mobility from your own um, biographical and experiential perspective. It really does, you know, and it's really interesting what you say, and I thank you for it because, like I said, the the I think what what my poetry is about is about healing, and for the healing to occur they had to be tremendous wounds. And so I, I, I touched on it in the beginning. Uh, I mean, I almost died uh, twice. And that's what it took uh, for me to have this mobility uh, to come to the US basically. 
So um, to address, so like I'm, I'm going to come back to it, but I just wanted to say something about what Vasiliki said earlier about home. And, and, and this is really where I've come to now, and it's taken uh, quite a bit of time to be, uh, to really feel like I'm a citizen of the world and I'm at home, you know, but home is always also a wound and an issue. And so I didn't grow up um, with uh, the foundation of a home that a lot of people do in the sense that uh, both my parents were immigrants in France at a time when Greece and Spain were not in the EU and when immigrants from Greece and Spain and Italy were considered, uh, you know, like Mexicans here in the US now. Um, so my mother uh, is 100% Greek and she had this very, very strong bond and connection to Greece. And she had a very strong sense of what home was for her. And it was also hard for her to be in France uh, as a result of you know, having left Greece. It was both, you know, something that she wanted to do and she loved Paris and yet. And with my dad, like I said, he was going to be jailed and that's how he left Spain. So it wasn't, uh, it was a forced choice. Uh, to him, that's like, uh, you know, uh, a forced decision uh, for survival. And um, my, uh, like I said, my mother's friends were uh, tortured during the colonel's dictatorship. Um, my dad uh, ended working for the United Nations um, in the Spanish department. He actually, you know, was originally a lawyer and then um, uh, worked as a, a translator and reviser. And, and basically um, all his colleagues or from South American countries that had experienced dictatorships. So I grew up uh, um, uh, in a very uh, heavily uh, uh, politicized uh, um, atmosphere and very, very aware of it. And I've, I've healed, you know, the wounds with my, with my own father because I am not gonna necessarily want to, to, to dwell on that, but when I said, you know, uh, I, I had a breakdown after two years of a medical school, that was as if that was not enough. My, my dad felt betrayed that I did not become a doctor because he really wanted to have a doctor in the family. My middle name is Vanya. I, I'm named after Uncle Vanya, Chekhov's play. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> and so my dad took it to heart, like almost like I, I just, did it like you know what I, I I don't know what what he really like I, I, on the one hand I, I have no doubt that he wanted the best for me and on the other hand he just felt that what was I thinking throwing away my life like that you know by by not like finding a way to, to stay there or and um and so for a long time we we had a difficult relationship and I was cut off when I when I moved to uh, New York I that was really um, a, um, a move of survival. I, I, um, I, I didn't have um, much help at all uh, from him. And, and it's, it's really difficult to talk about it because we, we really have, have healed that wound, you know, but I was on my own and I went there with nothing. I, um, I, I struggled. Um, most of the time I was there. So I, the, 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 the meaning of home for me was always where I could find, um, in a way, a substitute family as well. So um, the drama school became my home when I was there. The actor studio became my home. My group of friends beha became my home. And um, I, I mean, my dad wouldn't even let my mom call me. <laughs> Uh, so just so you see, and so, but I would, I would fly, you know, I, I, I was working, um, I was working three jobs while I was at the American Academy. So I, I was working, um, in a restaurant. Um, I was working, uh, in a, in a health club. I was just working all the time that I wasn't studying to survive. I was living in a, in a student house. It was, it, it was a constant struggle. And I wasn't, um, the US has opened up a little bit towards uh, foreigners in the entertainment industry. Um, and I am an American now, but even when I uh, became an American citizen, I, 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 
I was still considered not, not American by a lot of people in the industry. But when I was at the American Academy at the time, there was one black actor and we were both considered exotic. So uh, it was never like, I was never in the club. I didn't have the connections. It was not that everything is was smooth. I'm, you know, I mean, there is a reason why uh, poetry can transcend. There is a reason why it heals, and it, it has to come from having healed the wounds. And um, my mother was very supportive of me. Um, she was only able to do that much, but her her support has meant the world to. It's like, you know, I, I would talk to her and it was kind of a, just, you know, um, a way to stay sane at times because I had nobody. And um, so after she died, and that was in 96, I told my father that I was going to sever ties with him now because I, I had no more reason to go back, you know, to Europe. And because I was willing to make that change for myself he changed and we 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 became close again you know and um the whole time that i um looked after him the the last year of his life um i experienced the um depth of his love you know uh, he still knew who i was and the tremendous love he had for me and there are so many misunderstandings in life you know and in families and in general and it's it's not always easy to it's always with um distance that you can understand what was going on at the time and that maybe everybody was just doing the best they could and all they knew and maybe they meant well you know uh, but all of this has made me who i am and so the uh, what's at the core of my poetry is really having overcome all that and having um, been able to appreciate what I was given and what I've been able to make for myself. But I studied um, with scholarships a lot. Um, I mean, this mobility is just, you know, it was born from a, a need that I had um, which was uh, rooted in, in survival. So I, I wasn't uh, at all, um, yeah. The thing is, you know, you want, uh, if, if when you read something that's um, transcendent, uh, it, the reason why, why it is, it's just because the, the, um, you've gone to the other side, right? And you can you can um, come from a from a, um, um, the empathy and the understanding and the light, as opposed to um, I, I I find it not very helpful for me. But everybody has their own way of 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 expressing themselves, and 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 every aspect of expression is needed. But mine. Uh, I mean, complaining is just not useful. <laughs> so, um, so that's where it came from. And and this sense of home is is I think is always going to be something you know um, that I think everybody looks um, that I'm going to keep looking for, regardless of you know I find ways to make myself at home. But I think home is is really the primordial question for most of us in general. Um, even when uh, it's been easier, you know? I think your home is the world of imagination, <laughs> the enchanting world, Elaine. It has been wonderful to, to share the, the gifts of healing of your poetry and translation with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think if I had had like, um, if I had been very rooted where I was originally, I wouldn't have left. You know what I'm saying? So I've I've had to um, hear all kinds of things. I've had had a French people tell me um, that I wasn't French enough because my parents weren't French. You know, just I've had Americans say that too, even though this is also like France, a country of immigration, you know, 
uh, most of us have had to deal with a lot of that. It's not, you know, it's not um, uh, unusual in any way. Uh, I haven't had to deal with race. I haven't had to deal with having to crawl through tunnels. But um, making my home here was was a long and arduous path. I, you know, like getting, um, I came here with a student visa and I had to, first what I did was get a, what's called a practical training visa, which is a catch-22 situation where after you graduate, they'll give you a job if you have a visa, but you need the visa to get the job. But what I had done is I had done a reading of a, of a radio play that was supposed to be done in New York. It ended being done in London, but the casting director uh, was also casting on a soap opera and uh, she loved what I did. And then she had asked me to write about it afterwards, which I could do. And she was very impressed. And I explained to her the situation that I, I needed a job to, <laughs> to get my visa. And she helped me. And really, you know, what matters really is the people who are there to help you when you need it. And so I got my practical training visa and I was told by the American Academy at the time that it was the, I was the first student who had managed to do that because a lot of um, uh, foreigners, foreign students and um, going back to Europe or, you know, or, or some get married to an American or different, you know. So, and then I got a, an H1 permit, you know, I was a uh, 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 visa and that was renewed. And then I got lucky again because I was asking everybody I knew to sponsor me. And, and things don't always come where you think, you know, it's like a lot of doors were, were closed or not opening. And then I did the lottery. And the second time I did it, I got my green card in the, in the lottery. So, you know, I trusted that because I thought I'm gonna be here the right way or I'm just not going to be able to stay here. And that's how I was able to stay. And after, you know, five years of the green card, you can apply for the citizenship, which is what I did. So, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I'm grateful for it. I feel very at home in the US because it's so multicultural, precisely. Uh, but at the same time, I'm also very European. And, uh, and I think it's great, actually. I look at that as a... Uh, uh, a very rich aspect of who I am, as opposed to a lack of not being 100% one thing or another. <laughs> I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. We're going to have to, to end, but Sorry. <laughs> not at all. This is a yeah, wonderful, wonderful conversation, and I think it could lead to many more. And there, there's so many themes that have come up that I think we need to pursue together. And you've touched on, on many things that have also uh, been touched upon with with other guests and uh, so this has just really created a very rich forum and um, I, we had one question um, Elaine if you could give us the reference for the poem uh, on on Aphrodite which collection was that from oh that's from uh, dreaming my animal selves dreaming my animal selves and what a beautiful title well, I want to thank you so much for all that you've shared of yourself and of your journey and of your exquisite poetry. And thank you all for being here with us. And I hope we can be together again soon. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you very much. It was really a wonderful event. Uh, thank you for being here. To read the new poetry collection, Selene, has been extraordinary. Thank yes. you so much. Very inspiring. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Of course. So, thank you. have more in the future. <laughs> Absolutely, and I look forward to And the podcast that. is arriving. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you all. Have Thanks, Helen. I just want to know uh, if uh, uh, acquiring or getting a Greek citizenship uh, is important to you and uh, what does it mean to you to have a Greek citizenship along the three or four others that you have? Well, we were, we were talking about it before uh, starting this and I, I, I think I, I may well do it, you know, to, um, yeah. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it it's my... something to have, to, to, have um, to be close to the roots of the, of the, of the you know, from your yeah. mother's side. Yeah, yeah. In, in a way, it's like, you know, it's there. 
but mm. then there's something also that's like uh, very um, concrete there in 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 terms of like okay you know I do you I, still visit Greece do you still visit Greece yeah I do I I have a really good friend in in Athens um, and um, yeah yeah I I haven't been in a few years but uh, yeah yeah. We'll yeah. definitely arrange for a reading again in Greece. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I have a, a Greek cousin. I have a Greek cousin um, uh, near San Francisco who's actually a, a very famous astronomer, Paul Callas, who's oh, uh, really? discovered an exoplanet. And so, yeah, so I have a, a family member here on, on this side. Of the world. And I hope you have more uh, Greek dreams. <laughs> Imagine, eh? Aphrodite, Aphrodite will be there more often. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have this other dream that I, uh, this other poem uh, that came from a dream that I, I didn't read today, which is called Uranupolis Pantum, which um, after my mom passed away, I went to Uranupolis, which is, you know, uh, at the foot of the monasteries. And it's a place where she, um, she loved going. And then I saw her in a dream. I had this dream that where I saw her younger, than when she was my mother, you know, and and I woke from that dream, I, I can't even tell you, with a sense of joy and happiness and seeing her all light and felt that it was all good now, you know, like, uh, and, 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 I, and, and I wrote that poem after that. And Lenny, what a coincidence, before coming here today, I was preparing the profile of our new poet, who is a member of Citizen Tales, and the last sentence he wrote was, his poetry collection was The Road to Uranupolis. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's <laughs> another <Yeah>. synchronicity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the objective chance is somewhere here around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been wonderful having you here today. I mean, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Nico, for having us here. And uh, I look forward to more discussions, more productive discussions, uh, as we're going to proceed with the podcast and uh, more, not only with maybe more interviews, if you have time, Ellen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, of course. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would love to attend some of your dream sessions. I definitely want to uh, attend. Give me more information, <laughs> please. <laughs> Yeah, I taught uh, a dream workshop uh, for something that's called the uh, 10th Gathering of Poets, and um, I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, yeah. I will be in the next workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. And uh, I, I really want to read the, the next poems, the poetry collections of yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye